Maybe you've heard popular intellectuals like Jordan Peterson and Robert Greene criticizing or praising the controversial theory of multiple intelligences. In this episode, we're covering the seven key ideas from the definitive book on the topic, Frames of Mind by Howard Gardner. And if you are the sort of person who wants to be great at something, the sort of person who reads books like Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell or Mastery by Robert Greene, but you don't have a clear sense of what craft or field is best to pursue, then this will be useful to you. You can look at multiple intelligences as a framework that helps you to understand your particular inclinations. With awareness of your inclinations, you can select the craft or field where you are most likely to build a positive feedback loop of successes building on successes. If you are in doubt about whether or not to explore your own combination of multiple intelligences, Howard Gardner makes a helpful point at the end of his book. He says that many people push back at the idea of spending a few hours exploring different intelligences in order to figure out what they're inclined to, when they can knock out an IQ test in just a few minutes. But his counterpoint is that the value of a few hours spent exploring your unique profile of intelligences will pay dividends over the course of 10,000 hours or more of practice, education, and work. And here's a metaphor to consider. When I was in the US Navy's flight school, the most failed class was navigation. And the reason that navigation was so stressed was because if your navigation with an aircraft is off by one degree, you could land in the wrong city or you could cross into another country's airspace. So it was crucial to get your aim just right. In the course of your career, you want to get your aim just right to be confident that you will also land in the right place. So if you want to deploy your time, money, and energy in the way that gives you the best chance to become a master of your craft, this episode is for you. One, linguistic intelligence. Howard Gardner has found that the most studied intelligence is linguistic intelligence. Language is the basis of so much in life, including how most knowledge is transmitted and advanced. Gardner's primary example of a person with linguistic intelligence is the poet, with their incredible sensitivity to things like the sounds and meanings of words. But Gardner points out that although many of us are not poets, we possess in some degree these same sensitivities, because this intelligence is the most widely shared across all humans. Given the ubiquity of this intelligence, how can you tell if you actually excel in linguistic intelligence or if you're simply a normal person with a normal amount of linguistic intelligence. Try telling a story in a way that is engaging. See if you like word games like Scrabble. Try writing a poem and memorizing it. Jorge Luis Borges is one of the greatest writers of all time, and when he went blind, he stopped writing stories but continued to write poems by composing them in his mind's eye rather than writing them on paper. If having skills like that excites you, you may be drawn to linguistic intelligence. Do you have an interest in careers that demand linguistic intelligence, like public speaking, writing, or legal professions? Two, musical intelligence. Howard Gardner writes that of all the gifts with which individuals may be endowed, none emerges earlier than musical talent. To understand the height of musical intelligence, just as Gardner used poets to explain linguistic intelligence, he uses composers to exemplify one mature state of musical intelligence. But if you didn't demonstrate great musical intelligence from a young age, and you're not working as a composer, how can you tell if you actually excel in musical intelligence or not? Next time you're listening to music, see if you can clap to the rhythm or sing along and in tune. Are you drawn to music not just as a listener, but also as something to create? Are you interested in careers in music, like DJing or composing? Three, bodily kinesthetic intelligence. The most apparent characteristics of a person with high bodily kinesthetic intelligence are first, the ability to use one's body in highly differentiated and skilled ways, and second, the capacity to handle objects skillfully. Howard Gardner focuses on both people who master that first characteristic, movement of their own body, like dancers and swimmers, as well as people who master that second skill, manipulation of objects, such as instrumentalists, ballplayers, and artisans. And he points out that while all cultural roles exploit more than one intelligence, this is especially relevant for roles which require the manipulation of objects. Gardner laments that despite this constant interplay of intelligences, our recent culture has attempted to divorce the mental and the physical. In turn, this devalues the intelligence of those who manipulate objects with great skill. Gardner also uses the simile of bodily expression being like the expression of language, and the boxer being like a great debater. Gardner says that the boxer is essentially trying to express himself in a dialogue with wit, style, and aesthetic that overwhelms his opponent and impresses his judges. Now, if you're not a boxer and you spend all of your waking hours hunched over a screen, 
How can you tell if you have high bodily kinesthetic intelligence? Try a sport or dance. Do you learn to excel at it? Do you have strong hand-eye coordination? Do you enjoy working with tools that need to be manipulated by hand? Are you interested in careers like acting, construction, or sculpting? 4. Intrapersonal Intelligence Gardner starts this section by attempting to explain the history of a difficult topic, the sense of self. And while that field of study continues to evolve, he points out that many of the core operations of understanding oneself are the hallmarks of intrapersonal intelligence. These operations occur in a five-part process. First is having access to one's feelings, which can be harder for many people than it sounds. To learn more about accessing your own feelings, you can check out a popular episode of my podcast about resisting emotional manipulation. There will be a link in the description, and for those watching on YouTube, a card on screen. Second, after accessing one's feelings, is discrimination among those feelings. Third is labeling those feelings. Fourth is enmeshing those feelings in symbolic codes. And finally, fifth is drawing upon them as a means of understanding and guiding one's behavior. If that sounds like a lot to grasp, how can you tell if you excel in intrapersonal intelligence? Do you feel like you are self-aware? In a, in a meta way, are you self-aware enough to know that you are self-aware? Do you have a clear sense of your emotional state? Can you keep a journal about your internal state and add nuanced reflections to it each day? Five, interpersonal intelligence. This intelligence is covered in the same chapter as intrapersonal intelligence because there are so many similarities. The biggest distinction is that this intelligence shifts the focus from the feelings of oneself to the feelings of others. This intelligence is also highly dependent on the previous intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence, because the internal discrimination of feelings at the core of understanding yourself is the foundation of knowledge of the feelings of others. People who have high interpersonal intelligence often thrive in roles as leaders, parents, teachers, or helping professionals such as therapists, counselors, or shamans. If you're not serving in one of these capacities, how can you tell if you're inclined to interpersonal intelligence? Do you feel like you understand other people's emotions? Are you empathetic and skilled at getting along with others? Do you excel at working in groups? Can you read other people's thoughts and body language? Do you like engaging in group activities or volunteering for community service? Six, spatial intelligence. To grasp the nature of spatial intelligence, Gardner suggests that his readers consider the tests used by investigators in that field. If you're watching this on video, we'll show an example on screen, but the test is to look at one image of overlapping circles, then to look at a set of four similar images and select the exact match from that set. Tests like this challenge the most basic operation of spatial intelligence, the ability to perceive a form or object. Tests go even further when requiring a person to first perceive an object then manipulate that object through space. Maybe when you think of people with excellent spatial intelligence, you think of chess players because they can memorize arrangements of pieces on a board. And Gardner writes that you'd be absolutely correct. An amateur chess champion recently told me that he doesn't actually memorize the pieces on the board, but clusters of pieces and their relationships to other clusters on the board. But if you're not a chess player and haven't been tested on perception of objects, how can you tell if you are high in spatial intelligence? Look at the roles you play when moving through space. When you're moving about with a group of people, are you the one they look to for navigation? Do you have a good sense of direction? Are you drawn to work that involves space such as architecture, photography, or design? Do you like to do puzzles? Do you identify with great designers like Leonardo da Vinci or Steve Jobs? Can you apply spatial metaphors to other ideas, like the way Freud saw the unconscious mind as being like the submerged part of an iceberg? You can also try drawing out some notes in a mind map and seeing how that works for you. Seven. Logical Mathematical Intelligence. Gardner writes about two crucial abilities in using this intelligence. First is the ability to recall and use a proposition. And while this recall would seem to demand a great memory, it turns out that people high in this intelligence are actually guided more by powers of reason than powers of memory. This is related to the second ability, which is the appreciation of the nature of the links between propositions. If the reasoning behind a proposition cannot be grasped, then a person is forced to lean on his literal verbal memory. So in either ability, recall of propositions or linking propositions, it is strong reasoning that supports what looks like a strong memory. But if you haven't formally tested your abilities of logic, how can you tell if this is the intelligence for you? You've probably had to do math most of your life. Do you feel that you were good at it? Are you a strong conceptual thinker? Are you drawn to careers like being a scientist, inventor, or computer programmer? Do you like logic and pattern games like Sudoku? Do you like to organize collections? Can you find patterns in poetry or music? Do you identify with people high in this intelligence, like Nikola Tesla or Bill Gates? Okay, 
you probably found that some of these intelligences resonated with you. Now go back to those and try some of the activities related to those intelligences to get a better sense of your unique inclinations. Once you have a strong sense of your inclinations and want to define your life's task, check out my video on examples of the life's task using the link in the description or the box on the screen. And if you're new to the channel, I'm Brad Carr. I interview popular authors and we make episodes like this to expand on the ideas that come up in those interviews. This episode was inspired by my first interview with Robert Greene, which is linked in the description. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe.